Well, good evening, everyone. Pleased to be here with you tonight. Um, I'll give you the background on my title here. There's a young man that works in the same office area that I do. Uh, has been with the company just a few years. And a recent graduate from SAU. Um, and so when I was asked to do this lecture, I thought I'd go by and just ask for some advice. Um, so I dropped in on him and I said, hey, I'm going to do this lecture at SAU and this is kind of what I'm going to talk about and he's seen some of this material. What do you think? And so he gave me some good feedback and he gave me a particular piece of advice. He said, try to put it in terms that's more personal. I think the class will be more interested if it's about you and the ideas in the business. I said, thank you. And as I was leaving, he said, you really need to come up with a decent title that's got a hook. And I'm like, okay, well, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll think about that. So I went back and I Googled Gen Z phraseology <laughs> or the Urban Dictionary or whatever it was. And I got some ideas, so I went back and I said, hey, do you mind if I run a few things by you? And I said something like, get lit with abstract thinking. <laughs> Doesn't, isn't that a good thing? And he's, well, yeah, it's a good thing, but you probably shouldn't use that. Um, get bank with abstract thinking. Um, so he suggested this. And I'm like, what does secure the bag mean? You know, it's good. It's good stuff. It could be money. It could be something you want, one of your goals. Did this resonate with anybody in the room? Please tell me you did, because I've got to go back and tell him that it worked. <laughs> he may be a, t a few months too old, right? Uh, so that's the idea behind that. So t this, af this evening I want to talk about abstract thinking. And so my goals, I'm hoping I can share something actionable with you, something useful. Um, I'm going to try to connect this with my career at the company and uh, some aspect of my development. I'm going to use our family business as sort of a case study, present to you a very real challenge for me in my career. And I'm going to refer to a number of uh, schools of thought, authors, and books. So a little bit about McKee Foods Corporation, just to give you the, the context here. Uh, these are our brands. Uh, Little Debbie, by far, is our flagship, uh, most uh, familiar with people. Drake's is a relatively recent brand that we bought when Hostess went bankrupt a few years ago. It's mostly a northeastern brand. Sunbelt's been around since the early 80s. That's our line of granola bars and cereals. Fieldstone is a brand we created um, 12 to 15 years ago, and it's a food service brand. So it goes to market very different than these other brands. And of course, this is the overall uh, corporate logo. So a few years ago, well, let me, let me back up just a minute. I'm going to give you a little background on me so you kind of understand um, my time with the company. So I've been working for McKee Foods for over 40 years now. I started when I was 16. My experience is very much like my brother Chris, my cousins Debbie and Rusty. 
uh, high schools, summer, working all through the operations, which turned out to be a great part of my development. I uh, got to see the operations sort of from the inside out. My undergrad is in engineering, uh, graduated from UTC. I took a leave of absence from the company after working in engineering for a while to get an MBA. And my first job coming back to the business was as Sunbelt New Product Manager. So I actually started in marketing there. Uh, my career path through the, over the years was marketing, research and development, engineering, manufacturing, company president, and then CEO. Uh, so like I said, my brother Chris, uh, my two cousins, Rusty and Debbie, had very similar uh, careers with the company. So we will celebrate our 85th year as a family business next year uh, from the founding of the company in 1934. Um, you know, the statistic, you've probably heard these statistics about family businesses, how rare it is for them to get into the third generation. Uh, but if you think about even a public business that lasts 90 years, how many public companies could you point to who haven't changed capital structure, haven't merged, haven't, you know, gone bankrupt, reorganized anything else for 90 years? It's pretty rare. So I don't know that it's just a family business statistic. I think it's any business. Um, and of course, our focus is on maintaining McKee indefinitely as a family-owned, family-managed business. So for the last 10 or 15 years, we've been very focused on kind of the fourth generation of McKee family members, hoping a few of those will come into the business and commit to careers like we did. So a few years ago, um, and this, is, this continues to be context about the company, a few years ago, I ran into a, a keynote by Simon Sinek. Anybody read any of Simon Sinek's books? Yeah. And I just happened to stumble into this, and he was talking about uh, his new book, Start With Why, and I was fascinated. Um, and so I came back, I read a couple more of his books, and we were right in the midst of revising our corporate statements. And so what he wrote about in this book it's a real quick read, it's very easy to understand, but it's powerful. Um, it's basically, his thesis is that a lot of companies easily can tell you what they do, and a few more companies can tell you how they do it, but in his opinion, very few companies do a good job in explaining why they do what they do. And so our senior management group uh, took this to heart. Again, the concept's simple. It's deep and powerful, but it's simple to grasp. We took this and we rewrote our, our corporate statements. I'm just going to show those to you for context, so you better understand McKee Foods Corporation. So the what we do would be equivalent to what you've studied or you've learned about as far as a mission statement. Uh, this is what over 6,000 of us come to together every day and do. We focus on baking basically, and the world smiles. So that's sort of the tagline that we use. Our big why, why we do it, we've identified five entities or five groups of stakeholders that are very important to the owners of the company, and we use the idea of smiles, meaning satisfaction with what's going on with our business in relation to them. Employees, our employees, our customers, our suppliers, does that surprise anybody? We look at our suppliers, we want them to smile. Our communities and of course the owners. The how we do it kind of replaced our value statement. For many years we had a value statement there. And some of the same ideas um, are in our how we do it. People, a better way really speaks to our continuous improvement effort and then the ideas around stewardship. And then, of course, for us, we have this separate family statement that we've had for probably 25 or 30 years um, that kind of rounds out our corporate statements. This is a photo. I don't know what the year is, um, but this kind of shows the company's roots. This is O.D. McKee, and this is Ruth McKee, my grandmother. This is actually uh, one of Ruth's brothers, and I think this was taken in Chattanooga, um, probably in the 40s. But I just call out, you see how granddad's smiling real big? He was always really happy to show off what he was doing. Notice the look on grandmother's face. <laughs> She's not so happy. 
And the story that's told is that she was sort of upset that they stopped production to take a picture for granddad. So uh, that kind of shows the blend of their personalities. So here's, here's a sales chart, and this begins to set up my point for the evening. Um, here's a sales chart going back to 1934, and we call this the rocket ride. And it's divided into generations, and these are rough approximations, generations of leadership in the business. So from 1934 to 1971, this is O.D. McKee's generation. And when I talk about generations, I'm talking about him, but I'm talking about the management people that he had around him. 1934 to 1971. This was, this was a tough time. They had a lot of struggles. Lots of ups and downs. They kept it together, but they built the foundation so when the second generation, which is made up of my Uncle Ellsworth and Father Jack, this is when the rocket ride started. Uh, I became company president in 97, but I wasn't CEO until 2003. So we mark my generation starting in 2003. And things got a little rockier there, didn't they? <laughs> we still got up there, but it was a little bit of a rockier ride. So kind of remember what this looks like, because I'm going to show it to you again in just a little bit. So here's some infographics just to give you a feel for what changed over time. So this is G1. Um, and my brother put these together a few years ago for their sales meeting, so it's a little bit dated. But G1 achieves $26 million in annual revenue, uh, one bakery and then two. We were in 37 states and selling to what's called large format only stores. So large format would be like your, your grocery stores. Uh, even Walmart wasn't on the map by, by 71. I mean, there wasn't much going on at all. So this would have been traditional grocery. Three to four hundred employees. And the, uh, the factoid is that O.D. and Ruth host a Christmas party for all their salaried employees at their home. So a nice, intimate, very much a family feel company. Look at the big difference here. Twenty-six million to almost a billion dollars after G2 is finished. And look at the employees. 6,400, all 50 states of distribution, six bakeries, all COT, that's class of trade. So dollar stores, C stores, um, big box, uh, every, every retail class of trade. And then G3, which we are in progress, this is um, myself, my, my brother, and two cousins generation. Uh, we're currently at one and a half billion. Did you notice the employment actually went down? So we're generating half a billion dollars more in revenue with fewer employees. We actually have closed one bakery. So this is the effect of technology and automation um, and advancement there, being able to produce more revenue with fewer, fewer assets in terms of square foot and fewer employees. And I didn't call out the change in the brands, but uh, if you were paying attention, you could see the brands being added there. So what about the future? We talk among ourselves that we've got 15 years left. Our business is changing rapidly, just like a lot of things uh, in the economy. And we've been focused on this milestone of getting the next generation of leadership ready. Um, so speaking of getting ready and development, I have one kind of odd slide out here that I want to um, share with you. And I was thinking about coming to speak to you today. You all are, are beginning your careers. You're, you're thinking about starting a career. You may be uh, into your first job. And I wanted to share with you, this is purely a personal opinion on my part. But when we look within our ranks at what we call high potentials, these are people coming up through management. Uh, we're looking at them for development. We're looking at them for more opportunities. This is a list of things I would suggest to you that I think is important when I look at high potentials. Uh, certainly technical competence. I say curiosity is really high on the list. Um, and really almost everything else under here I probably would consider emotional intelligence. So high EQ, um, self-confident, being transparent and honest, 
uh, well-read, wide interest, holistic life balance, public speaking is a plus, certainly that's something you can develop with time, looking for win-wins. And the last one, whoops, <laughs> I just blew it. <laughs> my, uh, my clicker hung up here. Let me see if I can get the keyboard out. Something just hung up here. Oh, here we go, okay. Abstract thinking. Sorry, you just got all messed up here. Um, so that kind of sets me up for this, this evening's topic. And um, when I tell my granddaughter, five-year-old granddaughter, it's raining cats and dogs, she's looking out for this. Literally raining cats and dogs. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, does anybody know who this is? I'll be really impressed if you do. <laughs> this character is Darmok. He's from the Star Trek Next Generation. And he's a Tamarian. And in his culture, they only speak in metaphor. So if you've ever watched the series, they only speak in metaphor. So those are the two ends of the, cont the continuum. Very concrete and literal. This is way off the scale. And don't worry if you practice abstract thinking, you're not going to evolve into Darmok here. That's not going to happen. So what is abstract thinking? Well, it's, a, it's an aspect of natural human development. Just like I mentioned, my five-year-old grandchild is very concrete in her thinking. As you age, you tend to move from concrete to more abstract. Uh, maybe more intuitive and less perceiving if you've ever taken a Myers-Briggs index. And you kind of know where you stand on that. You're looking for patterns and relationships, um, use, of, use of metaphor and analogy, and being able to sort of synthesize what seems like disparate sets of data or information. So my, my guess is when you start your career, many of you will be valued because of more concrete thinking. You may step into an analyst job, lots of data, lots of analysis, and so on. I'd also suggest to you as you move in your career and advance, more aspects of abstract thinking will, will become more and more important to you. So back to the rocket ride. Um, it was the late 90s, I mentioned right about in here, that I was um, company president. And as company president, thinking about the future. Um, and the question for me and the question always for any company is, how much more growth have we got and how are we going to get it? Where are we going to find it? That's always the question. What's going to happen out here? If you project what's happened in the past, you know, you might extrapolate it on like that. But your intuition tells you that's probably not the case. Um, so I was not satisfied with just projecting the past. You know, we could do all sorts of modeling, uh, projections, extrapolations, demographic data, economic data, retail data, making assumptions about how consumer tastes were going to change. You can pretty well wear yourself out trying to think about what is the stuff we know and what's it going to do in the future. So I face this nagging question about what the company should be doing now to get ready for the next 5, 10, or 20 years. And as I've said before, we very much have a long-term perspective. My generation's got 15 more years. We want the company to be in a great position for that next generation who can take it another 30 years and so on. So about this time, I, I ran into this book. And I don't even remember where I ran into it. I wasn't looking for it. I sort of stumbled into it. And I was so impressed with what I read, I actually invited the author, and he came to spend a day with our senior management group doing strategic planning, uh, Lawrence Miller, call him Larry. And this book um, and this author was my first experience with what I'm going to call the S-curve. And I'm going to talk the rest of the evening about the S-curve. And so Larry Miller's thesis is that like civilizations rise and fall, Businesses face the same kind of dynamics, innate dynamics, that create a certain default life cycle path. 
And this is one of many um, since then, and I've stayed in touch with Larry over the years. This is one of the many uh, versions of his, what I'm going to call the S-curve, uh, that he's produced. And so you can, see the, you can see what's going on here. So you go from command style leadership to collaborative in the center. And then as things begin to fall apart, you get back into a command type approach. These are archetypes. The prophet, the barbarian, the builder, and the explorer. In his original book, The Administrator, the age of the administrator was right at the top. As the civilization or the business begins to slide, you, you get overtaken with bureaucracy. This is the age of the bureaucrat, and then finally the aristocrat. So think of the rise and fall of Rome. That's the classic. Um, and that's part of his thesis. So, now that you've seen the generations from McKee Foods, the rocket ride, who do you think is represented by the prophet? OD, yep, his generation, very much. Hard driving, uh, risk taking, chaotic. Uh, this is the age of, this is our first generation. Who would be kind of the, representing the leadership or the generation there? That would be the Jack and Ellsworth of the second generation. So can you see when I read the book, I could see our business playing out sort of in front of my eyes. And of course, I was thinking of myself and my generation sort of setting up here at this peak of value, and then what comes next? And this is a little bit of a wake-up call. What comes next? Because Larry's thesis is, if distinct and deliberate action is not taken, the dynamics are such that you just see this over and over and over again. And you can, you can look around the world today and see it. Um, now, when, when Larry Miller wrote the book, he suggested that the way out of this trap was an archetype called the synergist. But I, left, I was left unsatisfied when I read the book, but he didn't, he didn't describe how to do that. He just identified this archetype, and he said, if you can pull this off, this is a way out. And basically his suggestion was if you can recapture some of the chaos, the energy, the risk taking of the earlier archetypes, you might have a chance to re-energize your business and pull yourself up. So keep that in mind because I'm going to build a pattern here. And this is an example of abstract thinking. I'm going to show you sort of the same thing from a number of different places. Let me show you one more of Larry's um, versions. This is the life cycle st uh, stages and the leadership styles. So at the profit stage, a lot of fear. I mean, fear of like going hungry. Uh, there were times that O.D. and Ruth's family lived in the bakery. They didn't even have a house. My dad tells me stories of riding his bicycle down, you know, through the bakery uh, in the afternoons and evenings. <clears throat> Reliance on personalities, the hard-driving entrepreneur. And think about a business that may be dissolving. Reliance on personalities and dogma down here, too. This is positive, that's negative. Condition of ease. Can you think of other organizations or entities that maybe you're part of or you're familiar with that are at a point of peak value and a condition of ease? So what happens here in the age of the administrator is a great force um, is at play for you to play, not to play not to lose, protect what we've got. Down here, it's more of a play to win. So you see the connection there. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to introduce a second body of, um, body of knowledge, a second book, a second author. This one is... <clears throat> a lot more recent for me, but very impactful. And again, it's based on the S-curve. Um, the book is called Jumping the S-Curve by uh, Paul Noons and Tim Breen. And I'm just going to give you the two-minute synopsis um, of kind of the theory in the book. But the thesis of this book is, much like uh, Larry Miller, this is time, this is maturity, or it could be value creation, that there are three hidden S-curves at play. 
And these S-curves grow and peak and begin to decline before their impact is visible in the overall uh, financial performance of the entity. Those three S-curves are market relevance, distinctive capabilities, and talent development. And of course, the whole point of their book is sort of a wake-up call to business leaders to think long and hard about these three areas and try to get out in front of the S-curve. And if you looked at some of the other illustrations in the book, what they would show is take market relevance. Before your market relevance peaks, their suggestion is to um, enter into the kind of this area of chaos, begin to do different things, invest, you may lower your profit margin, you may create other issues, develop a new level of market relevance and come back out before you've had a chance to, to begin to damage the overall company performance because you're in the decline, either market relevance, talent, or distinctive capabilities. Do you see the connection with the first chart I showed you? The rise and fall of civilizations? It's sort of got the same idea in there. This is another piece uh, to the S-curve uh, that's in the book here. So the chaos that they talk about is right here. And this, isn't talk, this, this graph isn't depicting one company. This is depicting an industry. Um, so think about Blockbuster to Netflix. So if you had Blockbuster sort of taking over uh, that market segment, and then Netflix comes in, and do you, some of you may remember Netflix struggled for a long time. I mean, they were very much down in this. And then what's going to be next after Netflix? It would be third industry leading. Think Toys R Us to Amazon. Or my, anybody do MySpace anymore or ever heard of it? Anybody ever heard of MySpace? Yeah, okay, <laughs> so it's still around. But it's not like Facebook, right? So I was, uh, I thought it was gone. I was gonna use MySpace and Facebook. Well, what's gonna be after Facebook? When Facebook begins to do this, and it probably already has, right? So what is gonna be the, the third industry leading business in that space? Instagram, Snapchat, okay, so you get the point. I mean, you all are, are living this. Some of you probably read the coverage that Jeff Bezos got recently. And I don't remember what the quote was, but he told a lot of his staff that Amazon would go bankrupt. And then he went on to talk about most companies have a 30-year life cycle. Now, why in the world did he do that? I haven't figured it out. Is he trying to motivate the troops? Maybe he's read the same books I have. He really believes that this is a thing and despite their best efforts. I just found that very curious. Why would he say that publicly? Um, maybe he believes it's destiny. The folks that, re that wrote the S-curve, though, would tell Jeff Bezos that um, he probably should be watching his back because there will be other industry players attempting to do this. But if you go back to my earlier chart, they would also say you could get out ahead of those hidden S-curves. And I don't know what those S-curves are for Amazon. One more S-curve application for you. This is something you can use personally. Um, this is a personal S-curve application. So think about, um, think about your health. Think about... Uh, investing, think about relationships, anything that's personal to you. Um, the point of the S-curve theory is that when you're on the upswing, before you begin to peak, begin to invest in that next level. And this idea of chaos, uh, discomfort, uh, low ROI, that's all held right here between these two curves. It's kind of that area of chaos. Um, don't be afraid, it takes courage to jump from one curve, uh, curve to the next. If you stay in your comfort zone, you'll begin to tap out. And if there's anything to this S-curve theory, uh, your rate of improvement will slow and you'll begin to stagnate. 
So I, I use the health and fitness as a good analogy. So you take up walking, and before you get maximally proficient at walking, you begin to jog, and that transition's probably a little uncomfortable to start with. But before you become a world-class jogger, you start to do high-intensity interval training, right, sprint, sprint training. And before you really tap out on that, you start doing kettlebells. And then before you master that completely, you're on to CrossFit, right? CrossFit's the epitome, right, of the fitness area. So something along those lines you can apply to yourself personally. It's just one more application of this S-curve. A third body of knowledge, a third author, a third book to share with you. Uh, Jordan Peterson. And I had no idea Jordan Peterson was such a lightning rod. I'd read two of his books and had no idea that he was a political and social lightning rod. And I found out sort of the hard way about that. I was talking about what I had learned in this book with a consultant, and she pointed this out to me. And then I started digging around in the Internet. I'm like, whoa, I had no idea. Didn't take anything away from what I learned in the book. Um, I've read a good bit of comparative mythology in my past, and the part of that in this book really kind of brought some things together for me that I'm going to show you. That's not even the reason he, read, he wrote the book, but he uses some of that in his, in his book. Has anybody read this? It's a, you have, okay. It's a, it's a heavy book. It, I mean, I like to read. This a dense, heavy book. <laughs> But let me share with you what I learned because you'll see how the content of some of his thinking connects with the things that I've showed you uh, up to this point. So, for me, comparative mythology, the significance is it gets us to think about fundamental aspects of the human condition um, that are embedded in these myths that go way, way back in time. I'm talking about ancient mythology. And so in my mind there's kind of two categories. You've got your creation myths, talk about origins, and then you have another category of myths that I'm going to call the hero's journey. And that's the one I want to focus on. And across all ancient civilizations, the actors, the vocabulary, the culture, it all changes, but if you look deep enough you see this same pattern. And I'm going to use the hero's journey to kind of round out this um, connecting the dots here. So there's two, there's two zones or two dimensions. There's the dimension of control and structure and the known. This is the predictable. This is the control. The other dimension is chaos, risk, and the unknown. And the default path that you see play out in these ancient myths, the old king represents the peak of um, development in a, in a culture, society, or civilization. That's what the old king represents. This is sort of the epitome. It's kind of like the age of the administrator. Uh, heavily weighted towards structure, stability. And um, the desire to stay here is heavily rooted in the human instinct, fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of decline, fear of chaos. Um, but the point of the myths and the point of Larry Miller and the point of Breen and Noons is that without deliberate impact or manipulation, the default path is one of decline anyway. You can't see that, but that's a dragon uh, down here at the bottom. So the default path of this civilization or this culture is slow decline. In fact, Peterson in his book refers to control at its extremes as fascism. And the end is death. So the tension between these two dimensions, between control and chaos, structure and risk and so on, is very much like Eastern thought around the yin and the yang. But it's different, and I'll come back to that in just a little bit. So let me fill this out. So the pattern of a lot of these myths kind of follows this sequence. You've got the old king representing sort of control and structure, the known. 
the hero voluntarily separates from the civilization or the kingdom. The hero is willing to sacrifice his life and limb in the quest for something, and I'll call that wisdom. In the myth itself, if you take it literally, you, you may not figure that out. It, it speaks to being his wisdom. After confronting some initiation, confronting the challenges, the hero returns, replaces the old king, and will face the same sequence again. And that's the hero's return in ancient myth. So do you see again the connection with the first, the barbarians to bureaucrats, the rise and fall of civilizations, the S-curve from Breen and Noons? You see sort of the same sort of things playing out here. So the point is there comes a point in every organization's life cycle that some descent into chaos is required. And that's what I begin to get out of putting these three or four different patterns together. You're either going to descend into chaos whether you like it or not, if enough time goes on, or you can deliberately descend into a little control chaos and try to take advantage of sort of the creative energy that comes with this region down here. So the very things that want to uh, cause us to want to stay in this region, the things that we fear down here, are the things that will actually lead to this rebirth and regeneration going forward. And that's sort of the paradox that we're facing. So for me, seeing the same message now from widely different schools of thought and sources just validated in my mind that some of these things are just hardwired into human instinct especially when we get together in groups. Because you see, you see different people talking about the same pattern from very different perspectives. And that realization is what I needed when I was thinking about strategic planning and the future for McKee Foods. Whoops. So there are two, in my mind, there's two major schools of thought around strategic planning. You know, Michael Porter is the father of what I'd call the deliberate school of thought, deliberate strategic planning school of thought. Probably the 1960s was, was very prominent, still is very prominent, but really started this school of thought around deliberate strategic planning, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s. Think about the economic times for the most part. Uh, very widely used, still taught today. Heavy, heavy emphasis on analysis and planning. You know, plan five years out, plan ten years out. Um, McKee has done a lot of this in our past, an awful lot. Very heavy on planning based on extrapolating the things we know into the future. And deliberate strategic planning really depends on having a higher confidence level in the predictability about the future. So think very much kind of a planning and analysis issue. The new school of thought around strategic planning is largely attributed to uh, Harry Mintzberg, and it's called the emergent. And so this approach began to evolve around the dawn of the digital age. So think about kind of the mid-90s, late-90s. And the idea is that the future is going to be more complex than the past, um, less predictable, faster changing, and so the emergent strategic school of strategic planning is kind of based on the idea that organism, the, the organization is like a living organism. That communication flow between what's sensing what's going on in the, in the environment and sort of the rest of the body is very important. You've heard of the, the learning organization, the value of being a learning organization that's very much in line with the emergent strategy. Um, being able to see patterns and respond quickly. And so what this chart kind of signifies for me is that for McKee Foods, we have been and we need to be moving this little marker on this scale, not completely away from deliberate, but just nudging it more this way and learning to depend more on emergent strategic planning uh, just because things are beginning to move more rapidly for us. So I've shifted my thinking a lot about that. Um, 
Next week, we're going to have an annual strategy conference. Um, over, at, over here, we've got the top 150 people in the business coming in for the day, and we're going to talk about strategic planning. And the agenda this year is almost entirely dedicated to developing capabilities, developing deep capabilities. And it's really kind of based on the idea that we can't predict the future like we once did. And we can't extrapolate what we, what we know about the past into the future. Um, all right, I'm going to give you one more um, school of thought, author, book. This is a family business book. Um, this, auth this author, Amy, works with us currently. And the first time she joined our family, um, we do family business meetings once a year. It's kind of family reunion, business meeting together. We had her come and speak to our family and she posed the same question that the previous three or four had. They all come in and this is kind of the first thing they pose. They look at the family and they say, what's most important to you, family or business? They try to kind of put us in a corner and get us to decide what's the most important thing, family or business? And we always really struggle with that. I mean, how do you answer that question, right? Because the two depend on each other, at least in our business. And so uh, the refreshing thing about Amy is after we all sort of stumbled around with that and didn't want to answer, she said, I'll suggest to you the answer is both. So that's a nice out, right? You don't have to answer that question, both. But she was serious about that because she helped write this book on fam managing complexity of family businesses. And they didn't come up with this uh, model, but they used it. It's called a polarity map. And I had intended to write the word family here in business here, but I failed to do that. But she used this polarity map to show us that you don't have to pick one or the other, but the two are in a constant state of tension between each other. And then she would lead us through, say if this is family here, you know, what, what are the upsides of really strong family? And you list the pros. And then what happens if that, um, that primacy of family in a family business has a dark side. What do the, what do those things look like? Like nepotism would be one. Uh, what are those dark sides? And then you come over to the business, you do the same thing. So can you all see the relationship between this, this uh, tension between chaos and control, the known and the unknown, and the previous three charts that I've showed you? It's not linear, it's not in time, but it's got sort of the same relationship. Um, so, so this is my version of taking some of those earlier ideas and putting in a polarity map. So you see over here, order and known you got chaos and the unknown, and this is the constant tension between the two. Now with the previous uh, graphs I showed you, this was shown linearly. With this one, it's like a constant flow. And so the upsides of order and the known, structure, predictability, safety, what are the downsides once that becomes stronger or too strong? Totalitarian, decay, calcification, entropy, kind of the same over here. With chaos, the unknown, you have creativity, energy, focus, but what are the threats? And so this is what we want, this is what we're trying to avoid. So when I said the Eastern thought, it's kind of the yin and the yang, this, is, this relates more to that. And so if you've got a Western perspective, we tend to think linearly, or kind of in time, time is one direction. So those earlier charts sort of reflect that. If you came from an Eastern perspective, you'd probably think about this tension more like this, kind of intertwined and balanced all the time. All right, one last analogy, and this really um, 
isn't like the earlier books and authors and so on, but it's a neat analogy I'm going to share with you to wrap up. Whoops. Okay. Anybody like to ride horses? Yeah, okay. Anybody ride gated horses? Can they see walking horses, saddlebreds? Okay. So I've ridden uh, gated horses a lot over my life, and I love this because uh, this guy, uh, I'm not sure I can pronounce his name, Maybridge, 1878. He was one of the pioneers in early motion picture, and he used multiple cameras to capture this time lapse of a Tennessee walking horse. The thing I want to point out for you is look how little this guy's head is moving. Notice how stable that is? And that's the whole point of a gated horse, is you get this fantastic, just perfectly smooth ride while the horse is doing all the work. So I want to give you the analogy here. So those of you that ride horses, you may have to correct me if I get this wrong, but I think you'll identify with it. So the way you get the perfect ride with a gated horse is you urge the horse forward, either verbally or you touch its hips with your heels. At the same time, you're applying gentle pressure to the bit. And you have to do both of those things at the same time. So you're telling the horse to go forward, you're telling the horse to, 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 to hold back. So the reins are for control, right? Control, structure, restraint. The touch is not really for chaos. You don't want chaos. But it's, let's say it's creative energy. So you're, you're trying to get the, the horse to be creative and provide some energy. You find that right balance, that perfect tension between moving forward and holding back, and that's how you get the ride. And my last horse's name was Cadillac. So he was just perfectly smooth ride. Do you exert too much control? What happens? The horse just stops. Or if it's a bad horse, the horse bucks you off. If you give the horse too much freedom or urge him forward too much, you don't have enough control. Um, he's going to go into a full gallop. You lose the dice rhythm and the gait, or he may turn and run back to the barn. So think about that. Perfect tension of control, and I'm going to say creative energy or chaos. So, summary thoughts. Hope I've demonstrated to you what abstract thinking has done for me in my career. Kind of that question I was facing, the resources I was going to, the way I was processing that in my head. So, my suggestion to you is to practice it. Um, follow your passions and your interests. You know, you may be focused on business, maybe a business degree, you're going to go into business. But stay true to those passions and interests, because what I've found in my career is wide range of interest in reading. You can bring those into the workplace, into your mission. You can bring those anywhere you're trying to make a difference. So continue to, to invest in those things. See the connections between this idea of abstract thinking and processing with your job, your relationships, your profession. Um, I hope I've illustrated how, for me, I synthesize these things. You know, reading one of those books, studying one of those schools of thought probably would not have done it for me. But seeing the same pattern over and over and over again from multiple sources was pretty powerful. You probably already use metaphor and analogy, but it can be a, a powerful way to think and process. It's also a powerful way to communicate with others. Oftentimes, we'll be struggling with a heavy topic. It's hard to get your hands around. Somebody will come up with a great metaphor or a great analogy, and they'll pop that out, put it out there, and everybody's like, yeah, okay, now I understand. So metaphor and analogy are powerful, powerful analysis and communication tools. And I'm going to show you one bonus slide. This really isn't part of my presentation, but... Um, this is where my abstract thought is now. So everybody know Maslow, right? You've all, how about Kohlberg? Been exposed to Kohlberg? This was my path. Barrett? Anybody, Barrett? Okay, Barrett's taken this to the next level. And then what about spiral dynamics? Anybody read spiral dynamics? This is the really new stuff, Beck and Cowan. 
So if uh, this is where my brain is right now because we're working on a uh, cultural shift in our business and it has all to do with our people and our culture. It's sort of organizational development stuff, but it's fascinating to me. Um, and it's another good example of abstract thinking because the colors, the vocabulary, even the theories of these thinkers are a little bit different. But if you begin to study them, you see the same patterns and themes emerging and tying them all together. And that's what kind of validates that they're onto something good. So with that, I think my timing is just about right. Open it up for any questions. Uh -huh. okay. As a CEO, um, and we're students, we complain about like perhaps not having time to read what we want to do. It seems like you maintain the ability to be well read. How do you um, choose what to read, and then how do you make time for all of the intellectual growth to maintain? Yeah, great question. So for those of you that didn't hear, as a CEO, very busy. How do I find time and make it a priority to read and do personal development? Um, number one, I'm very fortunate that my staff are very capable and um, I can find some time, although most of my reading I do on long airplane rides and vacation. I do a little bit at home, but it's mostly those long airplane rides and vacation. And I, find, I think that self-development and reflection in this kind of reading is super important. So it's something in our culture we're trying to promote a little more. Um, a lot of our uh, senior management will do like, I hate to call them book clubs, but you know, here's a book, everyone read this, and then we're going to spend 30 minutes at each of our staff meetings and we're going to talk about it. So we're, we're getting better at that to institutionalize it. Good question. Yeah. How did you hear about Max Neumann yesterday for that group to look online? I read his first book called uh, 12 Steps to... 12 Steps to Life. Yes. It's actually a later, it's a later book. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, that's the first one I read, and I said, I like the way this guy thinks. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for other books from him, and I just ran across yeah. that. Yeah. He, he wrote that 12 Rules for Life because Max Newman is so, <laughs> so uh, hard. Like an average person. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I can understand. It's, it's dense. It really is. I saw another hand. You know, that hasn't ever been a problem for me. Um, my travel schedule is not that terrible. I mean, that's one, th one blessing that I have. It's not a lot of overnight kind of travel. Um, it's more kind of day trips. So that hasn't been that hard a problem for me. And I'm not sure what I've done to be conscious of that. I think the travel is the biggest thing. You know, if I was in a sales job, like a lot of our folks are, that would be very, very tough. So I think travel is the biggest issue. Um, yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So, to answer your first question, I've not written a book. Um, Are you planning on it? No, no plans. <laughs> I don't quite have enough time for that. Um, second question is a really good one. So, you're, you've profiled yourself as more of that creative, chaotic, unstructured. Um, I'm structured, but I'm struggling creatively. Okay, <laughs> that's like right on the border, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you just from my perspective that that the creative, not chaotic, but creative, energetic, passion, I mean, those, those folks are very valuable in our business. I will also say that a, a business um, that's at where we're at in the life cycle, that age of the administrator, can be hard on those types. I mean, it can, can be hard. That culture can be hard on kind of more of that free spirit. 
So we have to, uh, those of us in, in leadership positions have to get to a point where we protect them. There's a couple over there that I've protected over the years because I think of the value they bring to the company, but the culture is a little like antibodies, you know, the immune system. So that's something to be aware of, you know, when you choose that first company or the company that you're going to join and work for, is what's that culture like? Will it embrace or will the antibodies come and, and run you off? Yeah. I saw another question here. Yeah. Okay, so good question. Everybody hear that. What, what would bring me to think we need to try to dip below that line and create some chaos? I'll give you a good example, a very real example. So we've been working on Lean, Six Sigma, continuous improvement for an, a lot of years now, probably a decade and a half. And we've seen the same pattern over and over again. Um, take a, a group of our smart people like the, the, the A-team. They go in, install all these tools, new governance systems, all the right stuff, flurry of activity, the employees are excited, everything's going great, the numbers go good, everything's going in the right direction. Then everybody leaves, kind of goes back to normal, and the performance just falls back to where it was. And we've seen that happen enough times that we've all sort of looked at each other and said, okay, there's a piece of the puzzle missing, what is it? And what we've concluded is that deeper kind of cultural piece that's a little flimsy or not quite as strong as it needs to be. And so what we're doing in the business right now is talking about things that uh, you'd consider squishy, <laughs> kind of touchy-feely stuff about uh, the human aspect of our systems. And that's creating chaos. So for me, it wasn't, hey, I've got to go create some chaos, mm -hmm. it's that going here, because we think we need to go here, is going to create some chaos. So I have kind of came at it a different way, but the two go hand in hand, if that makes any sense. Um, how do you personally define success for Like personal success? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say in my career, it's being able to see a tangible impact not necessarily bottom line or other things, but um, impact in the business that kind of furthers, um, say furthers our culture. I mean, we have a good culture, a good place to work. If I can knock that up a few notches, I feel good about that. Uh, so it's not, it's not always financial. It's more positive impact in our organization. Are you part of the family in the family business? I am not. Okay, so you, you're saying if you... No, I'm just an employee. If you work in a family I'm business. In the business. Yeah. So how do I help the business to keep growing? That's a tough one. So I, I, to me, the, kind of the first decision point is, is there more growth available if you keep doing the good things you've been doing? I mean, where are you in the growth curve? If you're truly at that, if you've truly actually peaked, you know, from all evidence, then you probably are facing the need to kind of shake things up a little bit. Um, but I'm not sure where that, that business stands. I mean, that's, that was a question I sort of faced, is with all the good things we've done, how far will that take us in the future? Um, and is the future going to look like it has in the past? I don't know if I answered your question good, but that's... That's kind of our reaction to it. Yeah. So where do you draw the line uh, from family to business? So you know, you need to work with your family. So if there's, you know, like where, where's the line drawn? Can you be more specific? So, um, uh, just like where where is it business and then where is it family? Does that make sense? Or <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah so, Is there a line or is there not a line? 
Oh, you mean yes. you mean personally? Yes. Like oh, yes. yes. Okay. So the question is, how do how do I separate my mm -hmm. my time, my family, and the business? Okay. Um, you know, for me, it's. Um, I don't know that I can actually say there's a distinct line there. I'm a little bit on call during the week. Now we do have, we do have the weekends sort of sacred, which for in our culture and our business is a great thing, because that's like a non-negotiable uh, piece. So that would be the distinct line during the week. It's not real bad, but I am a little bit on call. Uh, but I try not to trample on the family side very much. So when it's my choice, I keep pretty regular hours. But it's not always my choice, if that helps. One more yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So you talk about the importance of putting a balance between maybe the two sides of the spectrum, between production and creativity. Um, but in order to do that balance in business, do you think, would you say it would be good for individuals, um, like let's say a creative individual and a structured individual, or do you look for individuals who are both structured and creative and have that balance? In my experience, I've not seen people that are blend, you know, a, a combination of the two. I tend to see people that really go one way or the other. And, of course, in our business, being a mature business, we're probably, you know, 80% structure, process, checks and balances, you know, not black and white, but that sort of thing. The minority of our folks would be considered unstructured, creative, a uh, little chaotic, um, but I'll, like if you're a startup or if you join a startup, be prepared to live in chaos. And so that's one of the things to consider for yourselves as you're getting that first job is what's your temperament and then this company you're trying to get a job with, where are they on the life cycle and try to match that. So I don't know that I've seen people that, that have the two and can switch one off and one on. I see people more kind of leaning one way or the other. Thank you.